Happy Valentine's Day and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. I am Taylor Rockwell. I do not have a Valentine in studio with me, but I am slightly in love with the Bundesliga given how many Americans are doing so many exciting things there. It makes me love the Bundesliga, which is why I wanted to talk to a Bundesliga expert. So I called up Matt Herman of the Talking Foosball podcast. We talk what's gone right and then wrong for Dortmund, what's gone wrong and then right for Bayern Munich, as well as discussing the season so far for many other teams in the Bundesliga. But then there are some like deeper topics, uh, such as the importance of sporting directors, uh, why RB Leipzig are maybe so disliked, but then maybe what they're doing to change that and the kind of work they're putting in to become an eventual title challenger. And lastly, which team you might not be watching, but probably should be because they're doing exciting things. And I want to add this about this conversation. Um, I tend to pre-write some questions just so I kind of like know where I, what I want to ask about certain clubs, um, but I write down a lot of the questions in the interview on the fly on a notepad in front of me. It's the first time in a while that I've had, or maybe ever, that I've had like two full pages of questions written out because Matt had so many interesting things to say, and really there's still a lot of them left over, uh, despite going a full hour or close to an hour on this one. Uh, so we'll have to have Matt back on. I think we're going to try to make his appearances on the show a bit more regular, uh, and I'm going to live up to that by starting right now by turning it over to me and Matt, mostly Matt. With me now, I've got Matt Herman of the Talking Foosball podcast. Matt, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me today. Awesome. It's great to be back. Yeah, it's great to have you back. It's great to talk to you on Valentine's Day. I feel like our our relationship is that much closer because it's Valentine's Day, and I'm assuming you feel the same. Absolutely. And All this right. is, I think, the first time we've you and I have gone solo, and it's a great day for it. It is. It is. Yes. <laughs> it feels right. <laughs> it feels like the right day to take our relationship to that next level. Um, before I make it any weirder, let's just talk Champions League, shall we? Um, so Dortmund Spurs yesterday, uh, I'm assuming that did not go the way uh, Dortmund wanted it to go, unless maybe they're doing some kind of massive rope-a-dope strategy. Were you surprised by uh, that result? Uh, definitely. And and if they were doing a rope-a-dope strategy, uh, this is a rope-a-dope strategy that has been going on for uh, about a week and a half yeah. at this point. <laughs> They've really not had results go their way lately. Yeah, I wanted to talk about that for a second because prior to the Spurs game, they had let a winning position slip in three straight games. Then came this 3-0 loss. How worried do you think Dortmund fans should be or are they already pretty much in a state of panic? Um, I don't think they're quite at a state of panic, but they're getting very, mm-hmm. very close. Um, <laughs> mostly it has to do with with injury problems. Um, I, I feel like things were, went pretty well for them. Um, they've really built quite a new team uh, under Lucien Favre this season, and it, it's kind of shocking, actually, just how many changes there have been, at least in terms of the sort of um, starting 11 regulars compared to last season or the season before. And Everything seemed to be falling into place. All the decisions that Favre had made about um, you know, putting, putting younger players into key positions were working out. People were maturing into their roles. And somehow, in the last week and a half, the wheels have kind of come off. Mm-hmm. Um, that, a lot of that has to do with Marco Royce. Um, Marco Royce, I, I mean, you can't knock the guy when he is on the pitch. He is a spectacular player, and he's produced throughout his career. But if there is one weakness he has had, it has been staying healthy. I mean, it's hard to say something like that or phrase it that way because it sounds like you, you're blaming the guy. But this is just the way he is. And Dortmund fans have learned to become, you know, to be very wary about how much contribution he can make over the course of an entire season because sometimes he just breaks down and Dortmund thus far have kept sort of under wraps how serious or the precise nature of his injury. I mean, all we really know, at least from the sort of media reports is that this is some kind of a groin pull or a groin strain, which is luckily not necessarily the, the, the sort of recurring injuries he's had in the past, but the longer he stays out of the lineup, the, the more worried people are going to be about the future of this team. And were there also uh, – so I'm, I'm fairly out of touch with the Bundesliga to be like upfront and honest. But were there also in, like injury or health concerns when it came to uh, Fav himself? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean Fav actually missed the game at the weekend, mm-hmm. uh, that 3-3 draw where they blew a 3-0 lead against Hoffenheim. Uh, he's had the flu. And you know I, I, I tweeted about it. I think uh, others noticed it in the, pre, the lead up to uh, the game against Tottenham. He offered Mauricio Pochettino a fist bump. <laughs> rather than a handshake because he you know, explained that he didn't want to give him any germs, even though he's more or less over the flu. Um, oddly enough, Julian Weigel, um, you know, 
sort of defensive midfielder and lately a center back for Dortmund was also out with with the flu. I don't know if he caught that from Favre. Uh, and that was also a pretty disruptive influence on this Dortmund team. I mean, really what happened is I feel they're – backline just had a terrible outing both in terms of who wasn't playing and and the guys who were playing not really being at their best so let's let's take it in a more positive direction for a moment uh because i wanted to talk about kind of like dortmund's season as it's been thus far uh because in recent years they've been one of the teams that's like most synonymous with pressing obviously that goes back to klopp and then tuchel uh how different have things been under five this season oh i mean they have had such a journey over the last few seasons. I mean, you know, Klopp is obviously an extreme pressing proponent mm-hmm. and, a, and a guy who likes to play vertical football on the counter. Then they went through a couple of years under Tuchel playing a much more possession-oriented style, although one that also implemented a press. You had the brief reigns of, of the two Peters, you know, mm-hmm. Peter Bosch and Peter Stöger, one of whom was very much into pressing in a high line. One of them was a, a real bunker uh, defensive you know, coach. So Fav in some ways is, is sort of a melding of those. I mean, Fav will definitely have sort of targeted pressing from his, his forwards and he likes his forwards to sort of um, play a proactive defensive role. I mean, that was in many ways the reason why Christian Pulisic hadn't gotten as many games as, as many of us would have liked to have gotten to see him get because, uh, you know, Jakob Brun Larson and then later Rafael Guerrero, he Fav believes, does that role better but um five is also not afraid to you know when he's up against quite a quite a strong team put a couple of banks of four in front of the the penalty area and and, and make them you know work through the, the, those two lines so it's a role that i think suits this team i mean the results have, have been there but i think uh there's probably in terms of squad depth at least at the back there might be some issues because Tottenham made them look real bad in the second half. Yeah, so I want to get to those in a second. First, I want to stick with that attack one more time, because obviously up until uh, the game against Tottenham, scoring hasn't really been a problem for Dortmund, which still is kind of amazing to me, given that they, they only lost Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, what, last like January window, which still feels relatively recent, even if it was a year ago. Why hasn't that loss been more detrimental? Why have they still been able to score so many goals? Well, they've had two real blessings. I mean, one was that after they lost Obama Young, they were able to bring in a, a really good replacement striker for half of the season in Michi Batshuayi, mm-hmm. who, you know, I think scored something like eight goals for them in half of the season, which is a, a, a fine return. I, I, you know, wouldn't even quote myself on that all that reliably, but it sounds about right to me. <laughs> and and uh, this past summer, uh, they made a really good buy in Paco Alcacer, mm-hmm. who, you know, we all seen what he has been able to do. I mean, he's had some games where he's come off the bench and scored multiple goals. He's uh, worked himself into a starting position, which has has you know suited him all right. I mean, he hasn't had that sort of lightning in a bottle um, performance in the last I don't know four or five games, but he, he's really a, a capable performer. And also, you have to you have to sort of give credit to Jaden Sancho. I mean, mm-hmm. this is a player that. I think people thought was going to be quite an interesting young player. And I remember seeing him, you know, midway through last season at a, at a Hertha game in, in Berlin and seeing flashes of what he was going to become. I mean, he, he gave some pretty big fits to the likes of uh, Marvin Plattenhardt, who's a Germany international, but um, nobody knew that he was going to be a transformative, I mean, even generational talent. I mean, this is a guy who isn't quite yet on that sort of, uh, you know, exalted young player stage of, of Mbappe or uh, Osman Dembele, who of course had his own Dortmund stint, but he's getting there very fast. And anytime a team is lucky enough to stumble across or, or, you know, if you want to give him credit, scout out a player that good, good things are going to happen. That, that makes sense to me. Uh, and so maybe then we should say goals, not as big of a concern. The larger concern, as we've already alluded to, what, six goals in the last like 105 minutes or so, um, and lots of those coming in the second half. So what do you think Dortmund will need to do, or what can they do to kind of correct that mistake, uh, halt the skid, and, and make sure that they hang on to that top spot in the Bundesliga? 
Well, I think some of this is, is going to take care of itself. I mean, for example, the, the real miss that they had, I feel, uh, against Tottenham was uh, Julian Weigel, who has been a revelation playing at center back. Um, he has really only been moved into that role over the past, you know, five, six games for Dortmund, especially since um, uh, Manuel Akanji has, has been injured. He's, you know, usually the first choice uh, center back for Dortmund. Um, but he's, it looks like he's going to be out for another week or so, whereas uh, uh, Julian Weigel should be back sooner than that. And the whole back line, at least in the second half, just was sort of swimming. Um, you know, Ashraf Hakimi, who has been also a, a real contributor on the offensive end, uh, you know, for a, for a, a wing back or a full back, either way you want to look at it, has um, put in a lot of, of, of results in terms of assists and even a couple of goals. But he also, his ambition, maybe it's all that time looking up to Marcelo uh, in the, uh, you know, Real Madrid squad player uh, pass that he has. He sometimes can be a little bit cavalier with the ball, or can sort of not take his defensive assignments as seriously as as he needs to, and that led to two goals against Spurs, and uh, that's a really big hole to dig for your team. And do you think like like, but is that representative of specific problems? Or let me put it this way: like, was there anything you think Spurs did, especially in the second half, that really just kind of exploited vulnerabilities with Dortmund, or kind of got at an underlying problem that they're going to need to address? Or was it just the mistake that Spurs had a really good, or was it the case rather that Spurs had a really good second half? They made a couple adjustments, and maybe Dortmund just kind of didn't rise to the occasion. Hmm. I haven't quite thought it through, I guess. Um, I mean, I think th- what we saw from Jan Vertonghen, uh, which is basically to be a pretty deep-lying um, fullback when Spurs were defending, to going to into a very, very sort of aggressive uh, attacking position and, and, of course, getting that you know very, very beautiful goal – um, I don't necessarily think that Dortmund were ready for that. Um, I'm not sure that that's something that um, you know a lot of teams are going to be able to exploit in the future because not everybody has um, players who can necessarily do that. But it is definitely some something to think about because Ashraf Hakimi, for all the praise that I have, have given him in terms of his contribution uh, going forward, there was a sense early on this season, especially in his first, say, three or four games in the side, that he was mistake prone. And there might be more teams who will be looking to to sort of prey upon him in terms of giving the ball away a little bit too easily or, or sort of leaving a bit too much space behind him. So I, I, I can't necessarily say that this is going to be uh, uh, doom for them mm-hmm. to come, but I don't feel all that confident or as confident as I do, did two weeks ago about this team. That makes sense. Uh, it also makes sense, though, that you would have felt confident a couple weeks ago because Bayern definitely not having their strongest season. Um, I'm curious right now, where we, where are we on like the Nico Kovac fired scale? Is he closer to sacked or is he closer to safe right now? I'd say he's closer to safe. Okay. Um, All right. I really think that's a good step for him. Yeah, yeah. And I, I the the more I think about this, the more I think the sort of the boardroom level of, of Bayern. And, you know, by that, I mean the people who wield real power there, which is to see Uli Hoeneß and Karl-Heinz Rummenigge, a little bit less so the likes of, uh, you know, Salih Hamidzic, their sporting director, who seems to be a little bit of a, you know, puppet. Um, but I think he's safe in terms of their now realizing that this squad was really overdue for an overhaul. And, I think they now feel that if they can get, you know, Champions League qualification this season, which I think is very much in the cards for them, they'll be happy. And I think they'll be very happy if they can either win the league or the cup or both. Mm-hmm. And, and he's still on, on track to, to contend for both of those. And so what, what sort of overhaul, if that happens, are you expecting? Um, it's going to be pretty comprehensive. Um, I, I, they've already got a couple of, things in place i mean benjamin pavar is in uh as of next season he's not really had the best season for stuttgart um but that's a very tough place to play at the moment it's not a very good team and a team that's had a lot of upheaval um so i think his partnership potential future partnership 
uh, alongside Nicolas Sula is, you know, going to be a good, you know, partnership that could take Bayern if everything goes well for another six or seven years. This season, I think the real underlying story has not only been the sort of, you know, uh, aging of, of Bayern's two big stars on the wing in, in Arjen Robin and, and Frank Ribery, which I think has been pretty well publicized, but just their defense falling off of a cliff this season. I mean, the difference in where Jerome Boateng and Matt Summels are today versus where they were a year, two years, three years ago is very, very wide. And even this season from last season, it's, it's gotten pretty precipitous. And Manuel Neuer is not the same goalkeeper he was before his, his foot injury, the one that almost kept him out of the World Cup. I mean, he's gone from being probably the best goalkeeper in the world. I know you might have other ideas as a Man United fan. I don't know what you um, could possibly be referring to. <laughs> but now he's, he's basically a below-average Bundesliga goalkeeper. The stats say that, and even the eye tests would say that this season. And when you have had that sort of extremely reliable sort of defensive core for the last, I don't know, seven or eight seasons, suddenly become below average, that's a huge problem. And it's going to be a, a real test for any coach, especially one who's just sort of putting a lot of new guys into the team. I'm sure there have been many, many, many think pieces on what I'm about to ask, but I'm going to ask you for your opinion. How, how would you or what do you think is the explanation for why those three have had such a downturn in form? Um, I think for Neuer, you can put it, put it down just about all to his, his foot injury. And, you know, foot injuries are super problematic. We know that from a string of footballers. We know that from a string of basketball players. There's a lot of guys who, who have significant foot injuries um, or you know, foot slash ankle injuries in, in Neuer's case, I guess, who just don't come back the same, or it takes them a really long time to come back to to where they were. Um, I would say for Hummels, it might just be age. I mean, he was never the most athletic player, and I feel like any sort of downgrade in in speed or or sort of decision making uh, quickness, which I think happens to players as they age was going to hit him pretty hard because he doesn't have the sort of uh, cushion to fall back on. I mean, he's still a good passer. He's still a pretty good positional player. He's just, in some cases, easier to beat than, than you would really want from a Bayern center back. And Jerome Boateng, I think it's a mixture of age, and I think it's also a little bit of a mixture of, of, of disinterest. Um, he's accomplished a whole lot with Bayern. He has um, accomplished a whole lot as a sort of... Uh, personal brand and um you know sports influencer he's sort of his vision of, of who he wants to be is a lot bigger than a lot of uh, german footballers who let's face it don't think of themselves as international brands or, or style icons and i don't want to say that this has been a distraction to him because i think that's sort of a a lazy um argument and one that i think a lot of football traditionalists in germany have 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 um put out there but i think when you get a little bit older and you've you know accomplished a lot of goals with your club that you've played for for i don't know about 10 years now i feel like it would have been a natural time for him to move on to another club and i think it really would have done him a lot of good if that move to paris saint germain had had gone through i think it would have rejuvenated his career a little bit and i think he's a little bit bored at Bayern, frankly and and how much of it do you think is that like for at least the last couple of years at least he's been the kind of the kind of dominant Boateng brother he's had the better club career he's been in very good standing suddenly his brother's now with Barcelona do you think there's an element of like what hold on now like I was the dominant <laughs> Boateng brother now suddenly we're both at these big clubs do you think he needs to move to an even bigger club for that reason? <laughs> Where is there an even bigger club club than Barcelona? That's the thing. I don't think there is. The only one, maybe, maybe it needs. We need to get one Boateng at Madrid and one Boateng at Barcelona, and then maybe that's what we need. The Boateng derby, the Boateng El Clasico. 
I don't even know I, how to I make think... that into a portmanteau, so I'm not even going to touch it. Instead, I'm going to ask about uh, Robin and Ribery. You said that like uh, this is probably the season where we start to see them move on. Maybe next season they're both gone. Maybe they're getting less, uh, fewer minutes like next year, which makes me wonder, are we looking at a 2019-2020 season of Alfonso Davies and Serge Gnabry on either wing? Or do you think maybe they're going to look uh, to try to uh, play Davies in different positions or maybe bring him through just a little bit slower once they have time to do so? Oh, they'll definitely bring him, him through slower. I mean, I think next year it's going to be Gnabry and Kingsley Coman mm-hmm. who are first choice. Um, I think it's possible that um, you know either Gnabry or Davies um, would get some time in the middle. Um, because th- there's a little bit of room there, depending on what happens with James Rodriguez's future, or you know the sort of um, continued decline of of Thomas Müller, who typically plays on the right or in the center. Um, but I definitely think that Davies is not going to be a regular starter for Bayern anytime soon. I think he's he's got a good future there. All the players seem to talk him up, and and Niko Kovac likes him. I think there's no reason to think that he won't turn into a real big contributor there. I just think it's going to take some time. All right. Well, uh, meanwhile, Bayern closed the gap on Dortmund this past weekend with a win over Schalke. Uh, That result, as far as I understand, is not that surprising, given that Bayern have won, I think, like 748 straight games against Schalke, something like that. Uh, But it is surprising that Schalke are 14th in the table. At least it is to me. What's gone wrong there? And is maybe like the managerial honeymoon with Domenico Tedesco over? Uh, yeah, it's definitely over. Um, not only is it over in terms of, of the results just being really bad, and we're now at the point where we're basically, I don't know, close to two-thirds of the way through this season, and they are neither getting results nor are they playing well. Um, last season, there was a little bit of discontent about how ugly the team would play at times. There was a lot of 1-0 wins or 2-1 wins or, or sort of somewhat fortunate wins, but they got the job done. And Schalke is a team who had been sort of starved of success for a couple of seasons, and, and nobody really cared uh, as long as they got the points. Now the team plays ugly. They look very disjointed uh, in, in many of their matches. Uh, they don't get results. They get run over by teams at times. It's a really bad situation for a, a coach who sort of – came out of nowhere. I mean, he came out of basically uh, getting, saving a, a second division club in Erzgebirge Aue from uh, relegation in the second division to taking over one of the biggest clubs in Germany. And there was a lot of skepticism about how he was going to fare, despite the fact that he was vaunted as like the, you know, the Wunderkind. He had finished top of his class in the, uh, the coaching uh, badges academy. And all of that shine has pretty much worn off this season. Um, this is a team that is set up to play generally pretty reactive football. It's a team that doesn't have a lot of uh, sort of creative juice, and what creative juice it does have um, has either been sort of bottled up or there have been personal problems. Um, I mean, Arit, for example, is, is a really good young player who plays sort of as an 8 or a 10, and you know there is a, a side story there which is really tragic and sad is that, you know, he was in, a passenger in a car in, in Morocco that happened to kill a couple of pedestrians uh, just prior to the season. And he seemed to, you know, really have a, a very difficult time um, dealing with that prior to the season. And Schalke really looked to support him and, and you know, sort of give him the time that he needed to get his head right and, and be ready to play football. And somewhere along the way, Relations have really soured between um, Amin Arit and Domenico Tedesco and with uh, Christian Heidel, the sporting director of Schalke. And now it's to the point he's basically been transfer listed. And there's there's the sense that um, he's you know, a, a young guy who doesn't have discipline, who turns up late to training, who you know, doesn't sort of uh, show a lot of effort in, in practice. And it's a real problem because – you know, when you lose a player like Leon Goretzka, as you know, Schalke did last season. I mean, he's a very good player. You can see what he he can do for for Bayern these days, as well as uh, Max Meyer, a player who, you know, started off at Schalke as as a sort of a number ten, got moved back to a six, 
uh, last season, but still had a lot to contribute sort of with a little bit of cleverness going forward. And now there's hardly anybody who can really affect anything. I mean, Weston McKinney is a very energetic player and a player who, you know, as we saw uh, against Bayern, can, can lay on a player who's sort of streaking uh, down the channel and, and, and weight a ball properly. But he's not a guy who necessarily is gonna gonna run an attack for you and 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 put a lot of fear into the opposition. And Schalke just look kind of blunt this season. They're so not scary. They, do you, they don't score. Why do you think they keep trying to use Weston McKinney in those more attacking positions? Then I think it's mostly because they don't have any, any anything better. <laughs> really, I mean they. I mean Domenico Tedesco clearly sees something in Weston McKinney that he likes. He has tried him all over the pitch. I mean, he's played him in central defense. He's played him as a wing back. He's played him as a six, as an eight, as a 10, as a striker. And it's really, I think that he sees that when you have, you know, a huge drought of, of, of strikers, which is what they have had this season. Basically, Mach Ut, the guy who they bought from Hoffenheim in the summer as their big, you know, sort of marquee striker signing – has scored something like two goals all season and has looked terrible for most of it. They've had injuries to Braille Embolo. They've had injuries to uh, oh man, it's the it's it's the Austrian striker whose name I can't remember. Oh, I know. Yeah, I know. I mean, they've had injuries to like every striker, right? Yeah, I mean, this is why they had to play. I mean, they have had injuries. So many injuries that they have had to play Haji right. That's, that's I was going to make that joke too, and I'm sad that it is a joke. But I was going to ask you that: is that like, is that more of an indicator of like they've been just kind of destroyed by injuries as opposed to Haji Wright has kind of jumped to that next level? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, I, it's funny. I I really want to see Haji Wright succeed. Of course. I mean, I I'm a fan of the USMNT, right? Mm-hmm. But. There have basically been so many chances that he's been given in, you know, over the last seven or eight games for Schalke since they entered into this um, striker crisis. Um, Guido Burgstaller, that's, that's the name that it was escaping me earlier. Um, and he's had a couple of tap-ins. He had a really nice goal, that one that was knotted down from Weston McKinney that he, uh, you know, sort of sent in off of his knee. But... He never looks very good in open play. He never sort of has that spring toward the ball or um, runs in, in or never really devises the right run to get himself open. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's there's just something missing from his game. Much, much more from Matt Herman still to come. We're going to talk RB Leipzig and the work that's being done there, even while lots of people still don't like them. We're going to talk Americans in the Bundesliga, specifically which one uh, Matt thinks, under under pressure for me, which one he thinks uh, might be next to move. And then we're also going to take a broader look at some more teams in the Bundesliga, including one team that Matt thinks people should be watching that maybe they're not yet watching right now. But before we get to all of that, I wanted to let you know about today's sponsor, Policy Genius. Policy Genius is the easy way to get life insurance. In minutes, you can compare quotes from top insurers to find the coverage you need at a price you can afford. Uh, life insurance is one of those topics I think that everyone knows something about, but maybe everybody is kind of scared to look into, or at least speaking for myself, I get a l- little bit nervous thinking about because, you know, then you're contemplating mortality. You have to think about what happens if you're not around anymore. It can be a pretty frightening proposition, but not with Policy Genius, which is why I appreciate them so much. Because you can go to their site, you can just sort of a few clicks, a few answers to a few fill-in-the-blank questions. Nothing too serious. You're not giving them your full medical history. Don't worry. You're just kind of giving your basic background, and then you can find uh, like kind of what you're looking for. They give you options. Then it goes from there. It's very simple. It's just a couple clicks, and you can get it going, and you can find them, most importantly, at a rate that you can afford, but that makes you feel comfortable about your long-term planning. You can tell that I looked into it, and I felt very relieved afterwards. So no matter how much or how little you know about life insurance, you can find the right policy in minutes at policygenius.com. And remember, Policy Genius is the easy way to compare and buy life insurance. Thank you very much to Policy Genius for sponsoring today's episode. And now back to Mr. Matt Herman of the Talking Foosball podcast discussing foosball on this podcast. 
This may sound very odd, uh, but can you explain Borussia Mönchengladbach to me? I guess that's the best way I can put it. Because, like, I know historically they're a very successful team. They're currently third, as I said. But then you look at, like, the thing that I was looking at today was their transfer activity. And it seems like they don't spend a lot of money or, like, by modern standards, a lot of money. And they don't necessarily sell players for a lot of money either. I think, like, their 10th most expensive player they've brought in was, like, 8 million euros, and the most 10th most expensive they'd sold was like 5 million euros. So it, it kind of then like threw me for a loop as to how it is that they kind of consistently remain near the top of the table or in those Champions League spots. How are they doing this? Well, I mean, to, to address the price question that you sort of brought up there uh, first, I mean, I think this is still an issue that a, a lot of people who – principally watch uh, the Premier League, Mm -hmm. um, don't understand, is that the financial scale of the Bundesliga outside of Bayern and Dortmund, and and even to a degree, including those those teams, is just, it's not even on the same scale. I mean, I would venture to guess that the, the, the record transfer fee for every club in the Premier League is higher than every team in the Bundesliga. Aside from Dortmund and and uh, Bayern, I, I would imagine that you know maybe Wolfsburg would be an exception to that, but you know Stuttgart. That was Hertha, literally the only one Eintracht. I was thinking of with John Brooks. Yeah, yeah, seriously. <laughs> but Stuttgart, Hertha, Eintracht, uh, Hamburg, Cologne, who are now in the second division, big clubs, clubs with a lot of history and clubs with a lot of fans. I mean, Watford can outspend them. Wolves can outspend them easily. So when you're thinking about like. A team like Mönchengladbach play, or, or paying eight or ten million dollars for a player that doesn't sound like very much. That like sounds like something that um, I don't know. Bournemouth <laughs> might <laughs> might spend on a on a squad player from Liverpool. <laughs> but for, for a club like Gladbach, that's real money. Mm-hmm. And and the fact that they you know did spend a little money on uh, Alisson Playa that was you know I think one of their biggest biggest signings if not their biggest and the fact that it worked out as well as it had and I, I really think that that was a, sort of a big step for a club like Gladbach who over the last four or five seasons have had a bit of an up and down time I mean they, they made it into the Champions League a few years ago and then sort of had had a bad year after that and now they're threatening to get back there but the fact that they are now spending a bit more money and they have sort of hit pay dirt with with some of their purchases is a big deal I mean I would say that Alisson Playa is a big reason for their success this season because this used to be a team that was was pretty dependent on you know, Raphael and Lars Dindel. And, and if those two guys weren't playing well, then, then you know, they probably weren't going to score a lot of goals. But a mixture of, of Playa, um, Florian Neuhaus, who plays in midfield, who was, you know, out on loan in the second division last season, he has come back and, and has, you know, been a really good linking player from, from defense to attack. And also Dieter Hecking, their coach, who, you know, at least among a lot of, Bundesliga watchers is sort of chuckled at at times for his uh, tactical inflexibility um, has shown some new wrinkles this season. He, he used to be a really doctrinaire 4-4-2 diamond uh, coach and he's really experimented with a lot of different looks this season and, and sort of tailored things to the personnel he has and, and shown that he has a lot to offer. So you may have just answered this there, but I was I was also going to ask about Gladbach. Like, is there sort of an underlying philosophy that guides that club that even if there is a uh, managerial change, like I think when a lot of people maybe got more familiar with them when Fabian Johnson was playing was when they had Lucien Favre as their head coach. Like, does the kind of ideology go, like shine through or is it more of a club where the manager comes in and they're going to play that way and then the next manager comes in and they're going to play that way? Well, it, it's always a bit of a mixture because uh, the German model, having a coach and a sporting director as opposed to a sort of all-powerful English-style manager, always is a little bit of a buffer against that sort of uh, zigzag course problem that you have have at, at clubs in England. But um, I wouldn't say that Gladbach has a super strong um, character as a club. I, I It's a club that I have a lot of time for, that I really enjoy – uh, seeing do well mostly because they have a lot of tradition they you know them and, and Bayern were really the two sort of major teams of the 70s in, in in Germany and they sort of 
established themselves as a team that, that, that played stylish football back then. And only sort of since the Favre era uh, and, and subsequent, you know, the, 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 the coaches that have, have come in after that, who have mostly kept – uh, kept faith with with a lot of the best players of that era. Have they sort of gotten back to playing stylish football? I mean, I remember, you know, when I first came to Germany back in 2006, it was a club that was basically a yo-yo club that was going up and down between the first and second divisions and really scraping by. You know, for example, when when Casey Keller or or Michael Bradley were playing there, it was a pretty pretty uh, thin gruel. Of, of football and now to, to watch this team that actually goes out and plays attacking football is is a total treat and I think a lot of that has to do with um, Max Abel the uh, the sporting director who they have had he was the one who brought in five which was a, a super bold move at the time in that they were you know last place and five was thought of as a sort of you know concept coach as opposed to a, a guy who would just get you out of trouble and that sort of ambition to 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 bring this club um, something a bit more than just sort of, well, let's survive another year. That thought, that ethic has 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 lived on since then, and it's it's a club that has learned to to be a bit more ambitious, to be a bit more attacking, and to sort of uh, try and get results with some style. So you successfully uh, deduced earlier that I primarily like or like the league I watch the most, the one I'm most familiar with would be the Premier League. Um, And so the the question about to ask you is like 50 percent like genuine question and 50 percent devil's advocate a little bit. But more and more, there's been talk about how Premier League clubs need to embrace the idea of having a sporting director, of kind of getting that position filled if you want to have success. Some teams have embraced it. Some teams have not. So can you talk for a moment about like the significance, significance and importance of that position of having a sporting director in there? Oh, it's huge. It's, it's huge. Um, I think not only is it huge in terms of giving each club a sort of um, sense of continuity or sense of, I don't know, um, connection to something a little bit less capricious than, than the results from week to week. But it also, I think, is a really important um, safety valve in terms of the way the club uh, is perceived both by the fans and by the media. I mean, there's a lot of teams where, truthfully, the sporting director is the one who talks to reporters and addresses fans directly a lot more than the coach does. And in some cases, you know, people view the sporting director as as someone who they sort of identify more closely with the club than than perhaps the coach. Because at some clubs, you know, you have a series of coaches who sort of put in their time, but you know that they're going to be gone for a while. I mean, Gladbach is a pretty good example of this, truthfully. I mean, I think longtime Gladbach fans probably trust and like and and feel like they know Max Abel a lot better than they do Dieter Hecking or they did Lucien Favre, who, you know, Dieter Hecking is a bit of a boring guy, sort of meat and potatoes. And Lucien Favre is kind of a, you know, cantankerous cold fish. He's also a genius, and I love him, but he's not the guy who you necessarily want to have in front of the microphone other than at the obligatory, you know, press conference uh, a couple of days before the Champions League match or whatever. So I feel like the public role of the sporting director is, is also really important. Uh, even alongside the idea that um, the sporting director is is putting a little bit more thought into what the move is going to mean a year, two years, three years from now, as opposed to am I going to get a win next week? It sounds then like to be a successful sporting director, to have a successful sporting director, they have to be there for a while. They kind of have to be steeped in the tradition of the club. Does that make it then like almost a like non-transferable skill or difficult to transfer that? Like I know like uh, Miss Lintot maybe would be like uh, an example here of one who could move or Monchi famously moves from Sevilla to Roma. But does it make it difficult if, say, Man United or Chelsea, both clubs who are in need of a sporting director, if they go looking for somebody, does it make it hard because you maybe are like looking for somebody who has all this familiarity with the club, with the team, with the region, with everything, that maybe that's a non-transferable skill almost, that moving to a bigger club or just a club in another country, does it make it that much harder for a sporting director to succeed? Well, I think it is probably pretty hard for a sporting director to to move his operations to another place, just because 
so much of the job has to do with with relationships with agents, relationships with smaller clubs. Um, but at the same time, there are certain there are certain sporting directors who you could see either you know because of their history, because they've already m- made a few moves. I mean, for example, Freddy Bobic, who is probably one of the sort of hottest sporting directors in Germany at the moment, who's who's in charge of Eintracht Frankfurt. I mean, Eintracht's story over the last I would say five, six, seven years has been pretty miraculous. I mean, this is a team, you know, much like Gladbach uh, about 10, 12 years ago. I mean, Frankfurt was also a bit of a yo-yo club. And now they're a club who, you know, has won a German cup, who went to two straight cup finals, who has gotten themselves into Europe, I think, two out of the last five seasons. And Freddy Bobic has made a ton of really, really canny moves. And, you know, one thing that is good about him is he kind of had his, his, you know, he came of age as a sporting director at Stuttgart, which is the club that he was sort of most identified with as a player. And, you know, a lot of teams like to go down that route of bringing in a sort of um, legendary ex-player to, to sort of, you know, run the front office. I mean, Leverkusen are, are grooming uh, Zeman Rolfes for that job. Sebastian Kale is being groomed for that job at Dortmund. Michel Preitz has that job at Hertha. And Bobic did not have a real easy time at Stuttgart. Stuttgart's a really tough club to run. Um, I was skeptical about whether he was going to be successful at Frankfurt. And he actually has been. He's made um, a lot of smart moves. He has played a lot of big clubs, both in Spain and in England, like a violin. He's basically gotten cheap loan players or players who they sort of undervalued uh, to come to Frankfurt for a year, for two years, and gotten a lot of value out of them and, and sold them on or, or sent them back to, to their parent club with with um, a lot of wins under their belt. And I feel like there are certain guys who sort of are a bit more, you know, uh, free agents, if you will, on, on the sporting director market. I could see them making successful moves uh, to England if England ever um, got its its uh, cranium out of its uh, rectum about this issue. <laughs> well phrased. Well phrased. I don't even have to bleep you. I appreciate that. Um, but I'm also I'm also just realizing now that the Bundesliga, in my mind, like leads the world in moves that are happening in the future. That there seem to always be like with every single Bundesliga club, there's a player or a manager that's like they're going to move next season. They're going to move at the end of the season. But there are all these kind of pre-contract or pre-agreements that have like uh, already happened. And it's only occurring to me now that that's because of the prevalence and the kind of success of the position of a sporting director. That if you have a person who's kind of overseeing the long-term vision of the club then you can afford to wait, like as uh, RB have, uh, as Leipzig have. They've, they've what, got uh, Ralph Rangnick in for this season, then Nagelsmann comes in. And I kept trying to figure out how that happened, why that would happen. And I'm realizing now it is probably because of sporting directors. It is, although, you know, the other thing is just totally cultural. Um, I mean, I, I lived in Germany for a long time, and at times it was frustrating, but at other times it kind of made sense to me once I was sort of swimming in those waters but like in Germany you can't just like you know subscribe to something and cancel it from one day to the next you can't just like go to your boss and say I quit I've got another job I'm leaving everything is done with you know (laughs) a sort of legally mandated 30 day 60 day 90 day uh, wait period so like it's a culture that is sort of subsumed in this, like, you know, uh, delayed gratification. So people don't really think it's that big of a deal when Julian Nagelsmann spends an entire season waiting to take over RB Leipzig, as strange as that sounds. It just it, – it doesn't seem that strange there. Do you know how I know that you lived in Germany for many years? Uh, your knowledge aside, it's because that club based in Frankfurt that we were talking about, I call them Eintracht Frankfurt, and you call them? Eintracht. Yes, yeah, you say it the right way. That's clearly how it's meant to be. <laughs> now, like it's, it sounds so much better. It sounds so much better. Um, I don't have any questions about. Uh, I, uh, I'm not even going to try about Frankfurt. I do have questions about Leipzig, though. Um, I and so like before this interview started, I genuinely was still kind of trying to figure that the uh, Nagelsmann thing out. Now it makes more sense. 
But what still is kind of blowing my mind a little bit is the relationship or the role of Ralph Rangnick for RB Leipzig because I was kind of approaching this with like, oh, I wonder if this is a – oh, I'm having a, a – a, like a, a brain fart here. Who's uh, Yep Hankis? I was like, I wonder if this is another Yep Hankis situation where suddenly they've got his replacement coming in, but he's doing really well. And then I realized that it seems like Ralf Rangnick is kind of consistently the replacement at RB Leipzig. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Ralf Rangnick at this point is sort of like a godfather at um, RB Leipzig. I mean, he is, for all intents and purposes, in charge of, of anything he wants to be there. I mean, he is the sporting director and the coach. Um, he was just the sporting director last year, and he will go back to being that next year. And he's just sort of the guy in charge of everything. He sort of sets his own rules at the club. And is that – do you think that's like uh, an intimidating thing for new new managers who are coming in just to know that there's this guy who can always kind of pop in at any given moment and generally do okay? Um. I would assume that it might be in the back of, of a manager's mind. I mean, he has not really sort of overplayed that hand over the years. I mean, he, since joining Leipzig and, and really concentrating on the sort of uh, sporting director level, at least since, you know, bringing in uh, Ralph Hasenhutl and, 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 you know, as he will next year with Julian Nagelmann, he didn't pull the trigger too quickly. I mean, it sounded to me like there had been some friction between – uh, Rangnick and Hasenhutl for about the entire second half of last season, for example, and he could have very easily uh, dropped Hasenhutl early, but it sounds like Rangnick is another believer in continuity and wants to sort of groom people or at least get people in the right place uh, at the right time. I mean, for example, the entire Jesse Marsh situation uh, seems to me to be one that, you know, this is a coach that they liked. They considered letting him take over the club this season before deciding that was probably a step too too soon, too fast, especially because of the German language skills. But this is clearly somebody that Rangnick likes, that Rangnick wants to sort of promote, and it looks like he wants to basically keep him around as his like, you know, assistant coach slash uh, protege. And then next year they're going to install him down in Salzburg. It sounds like. Yeah. So I was going to ask, do you think that's that's pretty likely to happen then? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I I would be quite surprised if it didn't happen. I mean, Leipzig definitely likes coaches who sort of come from their own system or sort of understand the Leipzig system. I would be very surprised if, if they didn't put him in charge or if they went with another coach who sort of was outside the, the Herbe ecosystem. It's interesting to me, especially that like maybe this is because I'm American that like they've they've got Tyler Adams there, they've got Jesse Marsh there. They seem like if they've got this kind of long term plan. They seem like they're a club that's kind of doing things the right way, and yet I'm assuming they're still the most hated team in the Bundesliga. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a real uh, it's a real conundrum actually. Um, I understand both sides of the equation a hundred percent. They are literally following the barest letter of the law when it comes to uh, you know German football club governance, when it comes to sort of compliance with the 50 plus one rule. I mean, basically what they have done is, you know, most clubs have uh, a membership in the thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands in the case of big, big clubs like, you know, Bayern or Schalke or whatever. And if you are part of a club, as I'm, I'm a member of Hertha BSA, for example, I would have the right, theoretically, to go to the annual general uh, general meeting and vote on things that affect the club. I mean, you can't really vote for anything that has to do with what players you should buy or what who should who should play on Sunday or whatever. But you can do things in, in, in terms of you know who sits on the board and so forth. And what Leipzig have done is basically they just set up the membership to the club. You know, which for me at, at Hertha is something like fifty bucks a year. The membership to become a member of RB Leipzig is many thousands of euros. So no one is really interested in doing it. They only have about 11 members or something like that. So it's basically just a puppet club for um, a certain drinks company. Um, <laughs> on the other side, and that, you know that, that has really earned them the enmity of all kinds of, of, of fans in, in Germany. But on the other side, they're doing everything the right way, which is to say, 
they are scouting widely and intelligently. They're finding players in you know lower divisions in Austria, in uh, Spain, in France, in MLS. They are bringing in people uh, at, at a young age, and they are giving them very, very high-quality training. They have a sort of unified club playing style philosophy. They have maybe the best physical facilities of any club in Germany. So it's a really first-rate organization at the same time that it's also a really cruddy organization in terms of the way that they thumb their nose at the way you know German football has, has decided it wants to organize itself. Uh, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I do have a couple more questions for you. Uh, one more team-specific one uh, uh, is about Bayer Leverkusen. Uh, it seems like they should be doing better, given the amount of talent they have. Uh, Peter Bosch uh, has not had the best time in Germany, as you, uh, I think, mentioned earlier. Is this a sort of growing pains season for Leverkusen of kind of like incorporating some of the like the young players that are already there and doing well, bringing more young players through and kind of figuring it out? Or do you think that maybe there's going to need to be another change at Leverkusen or maybe a sort of a, a kind of wholesale overhaul? Well, hmm. I mean, first of all, there doesn't need to be another change at Leverkusen in, at the sort of coaching level. I mean, Peter Bosch has only been in, in the job for a few games and the results have been good. The results have been hugely encouraging and they've basically been shooting up the table like a rocket. And, you know, I, I would not be surprised to see them end in the top four um, at the end of the season if, if things keep going their way. Um, that said, I think when it comes to sort of the team's squad, I don't know that they are going to have a lot of say over what kind of overall haul there will be or when it will happen. Because, you know, they've got a <laughs> lot of young players who are going to sold who are going to be sold for a unholy amount of money. I mean... Kai Havertz and Leon Bailey alone mm-hmm. are probably going to fetch a combined, I don't know, 120, 150 million. And if you add Julian Brandt to that equation, you know, tack on another 30, 40. So this is a club that has some real gems on its books right now. And I think that they have made the very intelligent decision to hire a coach who is going to put uh, a playing style in place that's, that suits them, that suits them, you know, sort of for, for being an up-tempo attacking team, which Heiko Herrlich, let's face it, was not really getting from them. And a lot of those uh, good young players' development seemed to stall under him. And I think that they should ride with it as long as they can. Uh, I don't know <laughs> that the ride is going to be long, but <laughs> it could be fun. Uh, so you mentioned that they may have uh, some players fetching some exorbitant transfer fees. Uh, now that Christian Pulisic, uh, his move to Chelsea has been confirmed, obviously hasn't quite happened yet. But yeah, uh, if you had to pick which American in the Bundesliga will be the next big transfer, who do you think it would be? Uh, I, I feel like the obvious nominees would be Tyler Adams, Weston McKinney, maybe Josh Sargent, maybe John Brooks, maybe? Hmm, that is really tough, actually. I, I, I kind of like where all of them are, uh, to be, to be fair. I mean, you know, maybe it's partly my preference to see good young American players in the Bundesliga rather than, you know, outgrowing it in terms of their commercial possibilities. Yeah. yeah, Or Uh, thinking they've outgrown it, which is slightly more dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm a little worried about him uh, at this point. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think, I think if I, if I had to sort of single out one, I would say probably Tyler Adams. I think Tyler Adams' upside, for me anyway, is is a little bit higher than Weston McKinney's, um, just because Weston McKinney, I feel, still has a little bit of sort of, um, I don't know, like crazed energy in his game, which probably needs to be filed down a little bit. Um, I I appreciate what he does for Schalke, um, but I, I feel like maybe the control in, in Tyler Adams's game is a little bit more impressive to me. That said, I would not be surprised at all to see Schalke uh, try and cash in on McKinney, especially if they decide that they need a, an overhaul because he would go for a lot of money. He is a, a good young player who has proved he can play in a lot of positions who, you know, is, is ready for, for a bigger stage if he's, you know, 
if he feels he is. But um, I, I really want all of those guys to stay, and I really want more guys to come. I mean, I can't wait for for Alex Mendez to to get on the pitch for for Freiburg, for example, because I, I think that um, the Bundesliga is such a good place for young Americans to be. It's it's obviously to me that, it, or it's it's obvious to me that that's that's the place to be. How far away do you think we are from Mendez making that breakthrough? Oh, it's probably it's probably a good ways off. I mean, I've I've seen some clips, you know, from from his U nineteen playing. It looks like he's playing playing well there, but um, it seems to me he he's probably likely to be a bit more of a, a a Josh Sargent situation where he spends you know six months or a year in in the youth levels before before they want him uh, at the top level. I mean, the, the on the other side, Freiburg is a team who are always going through squad upheaval. I mean, they typically are, are a real selling club in Germany. I mean, it's hard to think of, of many, you know, top half teams in Germany who don't have a couple of guys who they bought off of Freiburg in, in their squad. So no one has to wait all that long for their chance if they're, if they're any good. So I could see him maybe next season getting into the team. See, here we are again with you having spent the time in Germany. You're able to delay that gratification, and I'm just like, when's he going to get time? When's he going to get time? So I appreciate your realistic approach. Um, I also, again, appreciate all of your knowledge of the Bundesliga. We've talked about some of like the bigger teams. Um, whenever I have somebody on who's so familiar with a league as you are, uh, I always want to ask, like, are there teams that you think people should be watching? Or if like, if there's just kind of some random Bundesliga games on to me that I'd be like, oh, that team, like, ah, I don't really want to watch them. Are there maybe some less heralded teams that you think are doing really interesting things or people should try to ch- check out for where they may be later or a player they have that maybe people don't know yet that they will one day? Um, right now, a team that I think is, is in form, um, although I don't want them to be in form uh, on Saturday night when they play against Hertha, because I don't want them to win, uh, is Bremen. I think Bremen are, are a really fun team to watch right now. I mean, they definitely um, they have enough sort of young guys in their team that they don't show up every weekend. But when they do show up, it can be sometimes real fireworks. I mean, they have basically three, four really good young attacking players, either, either strikers or wing strikers or guys who sort of play at the 8-10 uh, area who are just really fun to watch who love to dribble at players who love shots from distance and are actually good at it it's not just a waste of everybody's time um i'm actually really psyched that uh josh Sargent has ended up at that at that team despite the fact that you know they do have a good enough attack that he's not necessarily always first choice but um it's a really fun team and i think uh if if you're not already aware of that and not already watching them uh, give it a go. They're, they're playing against Hertha on Saturday, and it should be a fun game. All right, and one more Bundesliga-related question for you, and it's going to be an obnoxious one, so prepare yourself. Um, if you were told that one day a team that is not Bayern Munich or Borussia Dortmund was definitely going to win the Bundesliga and you had to put money on it, what team would you be betting on? Uh, are we betting on this season or just in At, the like in, in the future? Like, who is, who is the, like, the club that you think will win the Bundesliga like the soonest who isn't Bayern or Dortmund? Oh, Leipzig for sure. Okay, really? J- just because of the kind of infrastructure they have? Oh, yeah. And I think that, you know, they have the infrastructure, they have the money, they have uh, a, a basically a sporting director and coach who are the same person right now, but are about to be two people, both of whom I trust uh, next season. I-, I just think they have their head screwed on. It's unfortunate that it's um, the situation that it is but i you know, i would also be pretty psyched to see an east german team uh win something so it, it wouldn't be all that there we are all right well matt herman i really appreciate it thank you for taking uh, all the time that you took thank you for bringing all the knowledge to the show i should add uh i don't know if you know this but i we have a, a reddit page like a reddit subreddit and on there i like i ask people you know do you have any anybody you'd really like to hear from is there anything you'd like any guests you want to have on the show and i think you were requested at least at least three times, but with a lot of upvotes uh, for the people who said, I want to hear some Matt Herman. So uh, I was excited to have you on the show, but you can also thank the people of Reddit for saying, we want Matt Herman or else. Spectacular. <laughs> oh, nice. I, I hope, they're, hope they're all listening to Talking Foosball. Yeah, and yeah, uh, with that in mind, how can people find you? How can uh, people hear more from you? Oh, yeah. You can, you can get uh, Talking Foosball on your, you know, 
podcasting uh, platform of choice. If, if you're not uh, if you're not as, as as Deutsch conscious as I am, Fußball is spelled F U S S B A L L, and uh, you can find me on Twitter at Mr. Matt Herman. And that's uh, Herman with uh, one, one R, R, one M, two N's. <laughs> Yeah, Herman, one R, two N. There we go. All right, perfect. Um, Matt, well, thank you very much again. Uh, It was a pleasure. Awesome. Thank you.